Let me uh, begin with uh, thanking Dr. Vijayanand Reddy for inviting me here. Yeah. I remember several years back he had invited me and for some reason at the last minute I couldn't make it and he was very upset with me. So maybe that's the reason why uh, he didn't invite me later, but this time I think he was a little kinder. Thank you very much, Dr. Reddy. The topic that's uh, been uh, given to me, it's, it's a very broad topic. It encompasses several things and uh, so I'm going to be very fast in areas which need to be mentioned but which are not very important and I'm going to spend a little time on areas which are really important from the practice point of view. Don't go by that uh, picture on the slide. It's not going to be only about fruits and vegetables. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. This I think all of us know. Try to practice as much as possible. But really, uh, how much of it we can and we can't is, is the question. As far as tobacco and alcohol is concerned, we talk a lot, we do some. Law can help. We have some laws. Implementation is very important. Infections, I'm talking about avoidance of all these. Infections of HPV, HBV, HCV, Epstein-Barr and H. pylori. More easier said than done. Radiation, of course, where occupational hazard of radiation is concerned and where a medical iatrogenic exposure to radiation is concerned, we do take precautions. But in general population, we can't. Immunosuppressants, again, something is not something that we force onto the people, but we need to be careful. Physical activity, obesity are well known, well talked about, very little done. Every WHO document, every document of the United Nations will have obesity and physical activity as a leading presentation. We'll have a lot of studies, a lot of data out there. But again, implementation is very personal. So we can't force people into physical activity. We can't force people to reduce their obesity. It has, the call has to come from inside. We can only educate. Diabetes, although there is no causal association, that means diabetes does not cause cancer, but the presence of diabetes is known to increase the risk of several cancers. At the same time, if you take appropriate treatment for diabetes, particularly with metformin, it's known to reduce the risk of cancer. Chemo prevention, again talked about, again plenty of studies out there, we all use in practice, basically is inhibition, delay or reversal of carcinogenesis before invasion occurs. So we have anti-estrogens and we have anti-androgens. So tamoxifen, raloxifen, anestrozole, used in routine practice, there's enough evidence that it is useful, but nowhere in the world they're using it as primary prevention in a general population. Most of us are using it as preventive for a second cancer. Somebody who's already had breast cancer, um, who's ER positive, we would give uh, SERMs or aromatase inhibitors for preventing a second cancer. But for primary prevention, general application in the population, no. Antiandrogens, not so much used, but finasteride, dutasteride is known to reduce prostate risk to low-grade prostate cancer. For other prostate cancers, it's not so much known. When you come to med medications, aspirin is very well known, reduces the risk of colorectal cancers. It is also seen in several studies to reduce the risk of other GI cancers, stomach cancer, esophageal cancers. However, again, there's no question of population application for primary prevention because of several side effects which are there. Statins again, the same thing. But there can be good observational studies on people who are already taking aspirin for cardiac conditions, people who are already taking statins for cholesterol, 
we can do observational studies. There cannot be randomized controlled trials because that would be unethical to give it to some people and not give it to some people. Metformin, like I just mentioned, again, has been seen in observational studies to reduce the risk of cancers. Antioxidants been used, been pushed by pharma for so many years, carotenoids, vitamin A and retinoids, folic acid, vitamin C, D, E, calcium, selenium, multivitamin and multimineral supplements and flavonoids. All of these, you have studies which say yes, they help. There are studies which say no, they could be actually harmful. Right? So again, these are not compounds that we should be using in our regular practice. I think at the most, we have been using them as you know, some, some kind of helpful treatment supplements, but again, we are not very sure. There are plenty of studies, there are, there are plenty of meta-analysis of all these studies which show that some of them could be actually harmful. They are definitely not helpful. And uh, thank you, Dr. Ragnath Rao, for uh, making some part of this presentation a little more easier. But cancer vaccines are something which all of us should know. We should know a little more in details because there's a lot of uh, information about vaccines that keeps coming in, and a lot of oncologists, a lot of pediatricians, a lot of gynecologists are using vaccines without fully understanding the implications of these vaccines. So we have prophylactic vaccines, which are intended to prevent the cancer from developing. For example, the human papillomavirus vaccines, the HBV vaccines, and then we have therapeutic vaccine. These are used for preventing an existing cancer from spreading, an existing cancer from upgrading. However, in terms of therapeutic vaccines, we really no, uh, do not have any breakthrough except one vaccine for metastatic prostate cancer. As far as use of therapeutic vaccines for any other uh, cancer is not found to be really useful. Let us take a look at the HPV vaccines. That's the most common vaccine that's out there in the market today. Most talked about, most controversial. We have people, we have associations which will vouch by the vaccine. We have institutions which will say this vaccine is useless. So I think we need to have a dispassionate kind of look at what these vaccines actually do. As far as the industry is concerned, we have the bivalent, the quadrivalent, and the nine-valent vaccine. The bivalent vaccine is 1618 is advocated for girls, females, between 9 and 25. The quadrivalent vaccine, HPV type 16, 18, 6, and 11, for females, 9 to 26, also for males, 9 to 26. The nine-valent vaccine, for females, 9 to 26, males, 9 to 15. What do they do? They're supposed to prevent HPV cost cervical vulvar, vaginal, and anal cancers. They also prevent precancerous cervical, vulvar, vaginal, and anal lesions, and genital warts. That's what they're supposed to do as per the industry. The industry advocates three doses of the vaccine. Dr. Ragnath Rao just mentioned that two doses are enough. So there are studies across the world now, and with the accumulating evidence, even the WHO and the European Union, sir, have started advocating a two-dose regimen of all HPV vaccines. We did our own study. There were several collaborators across the country using two doses versus three doses. Unfortunately, for reasons not connected with us, the study had to be stopped because of a lot of ethical and controversial issues associated with vaccines. However, by the time the study was stopped, 
it, it took almost two years for the ICMR to go through an inquiry and find out that it had nothing to do with the vaccination, that the deaths related to the vaccine had occurred. I came back to our ethics committee because when we wrote to the ICMR saying that, give us some direction in this, we need to restart these studies, they said, no, we cannot, because the government has said, not said that yes or no. So they said, you can go back to your ethics committees, and if they allow, you go ahead. I went back to our ethics committee, and Siddharth is here. So the ethics committee said, if the government says that you cannot, you cannot. So then I spoke to the ethics committee and convinced them that wouldn't it be unethical that I have promised some girls three doses and given only two doses or one dose, and I have taken signatures of their parents on papers, consent, that I'll be giving two doses but given only one dose. Isn't that equally unethical? They said, yes, they accept it. They said, okay, only those girls which have received at least one dose so far, you can go ahead and complete your protocols. But again, there was a dissenting voice there. They said that, but your protocol period is expired. You had said they're going to give at one month, six months, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But now it's all already two years. That protocol period is expired. Luckily, I managed to get a study on the internet which showed that it doesn't matter when you give the next dose of HPV. It's still useful. I went back to the ethics committee. They said, "Okay." Then I went back and arm twisted our ethics committee a little bit more, and said, "Please allow me also to collect on the long term." biological samples from these girls who will be vaccinated. They were kind enough. They, said they saw good signs in this, and they said that yes. So we published a couple of years back the first report. Just try to understand that at that point of time, we had girls who had received a single dose. We had girls who had received two doses per protocol, and girls who had received two doses not per protocol. There were girls who received three doses per protocol and girls who received three doses not per protocol. So we, we were in a, a kind of you know, quasi-experimental situation, not of our own doing, but thanks to ICMR, which is very difficult to get. No ethics committee is going to permit that, that kind of a situation. So getting that, we looked at the data. Although the denominator, the number of girls, of course, was not enough to give a significant answer to the scientific questions, but there were good leads out there. And what did those leads show? And there's a publication in The Lancet, you can take a look at it. It showed that those girls who received two doses per protocol or three doses per protocol, right from day one, had very similar immunity. There was no difference in the immunological response. And this continues, whereas girls who received a single dose of the vaccine did not have the similar level of immunological response on day one. The dose two and three continue up to 36 months the same way, but they catch up with the dose one girls at 36 months. That means post 36 months, it doesn't matter whether the girl received one dose or two doses or three doses, the immunity is same. So, it's not just whether we could give two doses or three doses, it's worth investigating, and I think a country like ours, which has got such a large population, can definitely investigate whether a single dose of HPV vaccine is good enough. So there are countries already which are giving two doses, and I think we should start, and the government of India is probably getting into the vaccine issue. We should also understand that if there are large groups of bodies organizations, governments that want to get into vaccination, there's an organization called Gavi, Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, which is providing you the vaccine at less than $5 per dose. So the government, state governments can directly go and purchase them, and if they do, then it would be worthwhile having a cohort of one dose of the vaccine so that we can follow them up over a period of time. What has this vaccine shown us? Vaccine has shown us that it does prevent incidence of invasive cervical cancer. 
we still have to wait and watch for the gold standard, which is a reduction in mortality from cervical cancer. And the first cohorts that have taken the vaccine are about 12 to 15 years old. It might take us another 15 years to know whether we definitely have reduction in cervical cancer mortality from these vaccines. I'd be glad to respond to more questions on email if you have on the subject. Coming to the question of screening, and I'm, I'm sure all of you know that the government of India has big plans. It has plans of having door-to-door -door screening along with diabetes and uh, hypertension all over the country. And they're starting as pilots, not on small district basis, but huge. Entire states are uh, going into pilots. I don't know the wisdom behind this. Because when I questioned the government on the appropriateness of the schedules of screening that they have put up, they said that, well, we had a meeting of very eminent people, and those are the people who put down these guidelines. Well, I don't know whether we are still living in a world of eminence or evidence. So when you're talking about the health of millions of people, and you're talking of spending billions of Indian rupees, which could be used more usefully somewhere else, you have to be very clear about what you are doing, and I'm sure the government of India cannot afford to do something like that. Let me see what I mean by this. <clears throat> I think all screening is for normal people, we understand. If you want to make it a little better, then you can give it to people who are at risk. So the population that gets screened is still smaller, makes it more cost effective. There should be good evidence that if I detect a particular disease early, then there are good treatment modalities which will help in reducing the incidence of this disease and preventing mortality from this disease. Now, there are a lot of tests in the market, and I'm sure you're going to get a good overdose of it over the next couple of days, which tell you that you have six or eight cancer cells in your body. Right? How useful that is, is for you to analyze before you start using those kind of tests. They are not really screening tests. There has to be good evidence that there is a mortality reduction. However, that's not necessarily a great endpoint that we can always reach. At least good observational studies over a long period of time, and several of them can help us to come to a decision whether screening is a good thing or not. So what are the screening tests? Honestly, today, there's only good evidence for cervical cancer. So for cervical cancer, we have had a pap smear, which has been there for the last 40 years, that has been assumed to reduce cervical cancer incidence and mortality in the European countries and North American countries but there has never been a randomized controlled trial of pap smear versus nothing. It's a long-term, you know, epidemiological studies, but pre- and post-vaccination. And it could be that the cervical cancer reduced because of so many other reasons. May or may not be pap smear. But let us give the benefit to pap smear. Then India has had at least three good, well conducted randomized controlled trials that have shown that HPV testing is probably the gold standard. And till such time as we cannot afford mass HPV testing as a primary screening test. Today, HPV is used as a primary screening test in the NHS, is used as a primary screening test over several, in several European countries, is also used as a primary screening test for cervical precancers in North America. We, at this point of time at least, cannot afford. Maybe sooner or later we should be able to afford. But VIA, visual inspection of acetic acid, which costs almost nothing, the study that we did, it costs us about 30 rupees to screen one woman. So that's something which I'm sure the government can afford. And I'm thankful that at least VIA has been adopted by the government of India as the screening test for uh, women in the program. Then come to mammography. Mammography had always been touted as something that can reduce 
breast cancer. And now we have studies which are coming out, plenty of them which say that mammography is of no use in populations below 50 years of age. So if you're going to offer mammography to somebody who's 50 years, below 50 years of age, then she better be somebody who has had a genetic test. He's a very high risk profile. But is it possible for us to have mass genetic testing? No. So families which come with strong history, like Dr. Sarin just said, we do genetic testing and for them maybe mammography might be useful. But I would still say clinical breast examination first by, done by a healthcare provider and if that person finds something positive, then you do mammography for women below the age of 50 years. Otherwise, you are spending their money, you are wasting your time, you are creating wrong impressions. Do not give mammography below 50 years. Mammography is definitely useful as a screening tool post 50 years. Mammography can be still used as a diagnostic tool in all ages. Difference between screening and diagnosis. I think uh, I spoke to Abhishek yesterday and he's probably going to speak on lung cancer screening, but low dose helical CT has shown to reduce lung cancer incidence in at least two studies in North America. I spoke at the, um, the lung cancer uh, meeting in uh, Vienna some time back, very recently actually. The person, the uh, principal investigator of the low-dose helical CT study from the NIH was there and she's been invited to Tata Memorial Hospital for the EBM meeting. So she came and asked me, so uh, what do you think would be the important things to be uh, spoken about? And this, I'm sure all of you can tell her, is that number one, the infections, respiratory infections in the general population in India are so m large that if you do a low-dose helical CT, all of us are going to turn positive. Mind you, all of us have been exposed to tuberculosis and all these infections all this while, especially if you have gone to medical colleges and worked in outpatients, you have been exposed. So all of us are going to be positive. So what, you're going to put uh, a needle and you're going to do uh, a diagnosis and over treatment, it's going to be the most harmful screening ever if we introduce low dose helical CT as a screening modality for lung cancer in India. Colonoscopy, sigmoidoscopy, high sensitivity, fecal occult blood tests. All these have been shown in clinical trials in Southeast Asia, in Japan, in South Korea to have good use in people who are at high risk to these GI cancers. There are other screening tests, clinical breast examination. We have our own study at Tata Memorial Hospital, breast self-examination, breast MRI. None of these have evidence of reduction either in incidence or mortality from breast cancer. Studies, there are two studies in India one from Tata Memorial and one from Trivandrum, Dr. Shankar Narayan's study. Both have shown that clinical breast examination by primary healthcare workers is able to downstage the cancers. There's a stage reduction in cancers. However, there is no mortality reduction. So the gold standard is not achieved. And I don't think that both of these studies have got the population large enough to come to those kind of endpoints. Breast self-examination, two large randomized control trials, one in Russia and one in China. Both have very clearly shown that there is no evidence that these reduce either the incidence or mortality from breast cancer. Breast MRI, again, I would say that you will be causing more harm in terms of the radiation that the person is exposed to as compared to uh, the benefit that you would give. PSA, all of us know. CA, 125, all of us know. Both ways can be useful, cannot be useful, but unless there is strong evidence, we do not use. Transvaginal ultrasound, again not useful. Um, I think Dr. Uh, Sareen just spoke about it, so. Skin examinations, not our problem. We don't have so many skin cancers. Virtual colonoscopy, alpha fetoprotein. There are studies which show they're useful, they're not useful, but in countries, where it's a problem, alpha fetoprotein is still used as a screening uh, technique. In India, I don't think, with the, again, the number of GI infections 
that we have, the number of uh, problems that we have in the population with GI, either alpha fetoproteins or FOBT is going to be a useful test. So in conclusion, I would say that it's not a question of one or the other, whether screening is better or prevention is better, but rather how best preventive and screening interventions could be complemented. They are complementary to each other. And while deciding on optimal cancer prevention and screening interventions, we should consider population risk profiles. We should consider cost effectiveness of single and combined interventions. And before I finish, I think it's very important for all of us to, at some point of time, as oncologists, have our voices heard. The program that the Government of India is going to start is going to screen women with clinical breast examination, which has no evidence, starting at age 30, 30. I haven't heard of a stupider screening program or a stupider intervention than that, screening 30-year-old women for breast cancer. I can understand screening for cervical cancer at 30 years, but that shouldn't compel you to put things together. I haven't even brought oral screening into this, although it's a huge problem in, the, in our country. All South Asian countries, oral, screen, oral uh, cancer is a big problem. I, I, I haven't even brought oral screening into this. Again, the government of India plans to do oral screening for everybody. There is no evidence that oral screening is able to reduce either incidence or uh, mortality from oral cancers by just screening. There is one study that too from India, Southern India, again, Dr. Shankar Narayan from Trivandrum, which has looked at all these questions. There is a small subset analysis which says that people who are alcohol users and people who are tobacco users, if they are repeatedly checked on an annual basis, then there is a mortality reduction. But for general screening of a population, there is no evidence. Again, it's a subset analysis. That study was not planned to look at or analyze subsets. So again, that doesn't become significant evidence for the kind of work that we propose to do. I think we have to rationalize this and they should talk to oncologists if they want to have uh, any intervention in oncology before bringing the, you know, the secretaries and the IS officers and everybody uh, out there who know everything about everything to come and tell us what we are supposed to do. With that note, I'll end my talk here, and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions, not here on this forum, but on email. My email, I think, yeah. I think we have two minutes. We have done. Two minutes is still we have. We still so have. We can, we can take questions. Few. Okay, that's great. Uh -huh. That's great. We can take up a few questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the permission. If you have questions, I'll be happy to take those.